happy. Sergeant Hannon is to wait on my call for the opening. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Sergeant Hannah. Ready? Okay. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Finance. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their videos? To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. GOV. Again, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this morning's meeting of the Committee on Finance. I am Council Member Vanessa Gibson of the 16th District in the Bronx. And I am filling in for our finance chair, Chair Danny Drum, who unfortunately was unable to chair this morning's hearing because of an unavoidable conflict. I want to recognize the members of the Committee on Finance and my colleagues who have joined us for this morning's hearing. We have Council Member Alika Amprey Samuel, Council Member Barry Gridenchik, Council Member Farrah Lewis, Council Member Helen Rosenthal, Council Member Keith Powers. Council member Margaret Chin, Minority Leader Steve Matteo, Public Advocate Jamani Williams, and I know we may have other members that have joined us as well. Council member Francisco Moya, and we will have other members joining us throughout the morning. And we've also been joined by Public Advocate Jamani Williams. I'm going to turn this hearing over to our committee council to go over some procedural items for this morning's hearing. Thank you. My name is Noah Brick and I am counsel to New York City Council's Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you will be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you've been unmuted, you will need to be unmuted again by the host. If council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be added to the queue. I will now hand it back to Council Member Gibson. Thank you. Today, the Committee on Finance will hear three pieces of legislation related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And as I begin, I want to always express our condolences on behalf of the City Council to all New Yorkers who have been affected by COVID-19. Those who have, may have lost a loved one, a family member, or a friend, and those who continue to be on the path to recovery and healing. We continue to keep you and your families in our thoughts and prayers. The first legislation is intro 1952, sponsored by myself and council member Mark Traeger, which would require the administration to create an online database to track the funds in connection with the COVID-19 pandemic. The second and third bills on our agenda today are pre-considered introductions sponsored by council member Margaret Chin and the public advocate Jamani Williams, respectively, which would create targeted property tax deferral programs for property owners who were financially impacted by COVID-19. This pandemic began tearing through our city in the beginning of March, and we immediately began spending money and investing resources to help directly respond and contain the spread of the virus. As the weeks and the months went on and it became extremely clear that other aspects of our daily lives could not continue as normal, spending grew to include items impacted by COVID beyond just the healthcare needs of New Yorkers, such as funding to address food insecurity and funds to move the entire educational system to a remote learning model. Some of this spending will be reimbursed by the federal government through FEMA. Through the various stimulus bills that have been passed by Congress, the city can access $1.9 billion 
in FEMA funding for work that is related to combating the virus, as well as overtime reimbursement for uniformed agencies. Through the CARES Act, there is another $1.4 billion in federal funds, and there was a $942 million increase in Medicaid reimbursements. In the past, when other large-scale unexpected events have occurred in our city that have resulted in large overflows and influxes of federal and state dollars, the city has set up funding trackers to provide transparency and accountability for how these funds are being spent. For example, in 2009, when New York City received stimulus funding following the Great Recession, the Mayor's Office of Operations created a database within six weeks to help track the funds appropriated to and used by our city. Similarly, pursuant to a local law passed in 2013 after Superstorm Sandy, the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget created a Sandy tracker that both tracked how the funds were being spent, but also who was receiving city contracts and how many jobs were being created as a result. Intro 1952 would do the same thing for COVID-19 spending. It would require the tracking of agency level spending, the source of the funding, and the recipients of awarded contracts. Although I wish, I really wish, that the Office of Management and Budget were here to testify today as they have the experience and the understanding and knowledge since most of our questions are honestly focused on spending and funding. I look forward to working with the administration and the mayor's office of contract services to ensure that a robust user-friendly and informative tracking database can be set up quickly so everyone can see how COVID-19 dollars are being spent. I will quickly turn to the two other bills on today's agenda the two property tax deferral bills. We know that there are many property owners in the city who are struggling as a result of the financial impact of COVID on businesses and employment. These owners through no fault of their own may have difficulty making their July 1st property tax payments. Therefore, the council is putting forward two bills which would provide targeted relief to those who need it while balancing our fiduciary responsibilities to the city and understanding the vital role that property taxes play in funding the city's budget. The first pre-considered intro is by public advocate Jamani Williams, which you will hear from. And the second pre-considered intro is sponsored by council member Margaret Chin, who you will also hear from. It is my hope that collectively as a city, we can all set up to do our parts and play our role in this work together so that we can afford to offer targeted assistance and relief to those who need it the most. And with that, I will now turn today's hearing over to our public advocate, Jamani Williams, followed by council member Margaret Chin to speak more in depth about their bills. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Gibson. Uh, my name is Jemani Williams, and I'm a public advocate for the city of New York. Again, I want to thank the chair and the members of the Committee on Finance for holding today's hearing, focusing on the impact of COVID-19 on property owners and the city's expenditures. Today, the committee will hear bills to address property tax liability and monitor the city's use of funds in relation to the coronavirus pandemic. I support all of my colleagues' efforts. And I thank them for introducing these, including my bills, and I want to align myself uh, with uh, the chair's comments on just remembering all of the people that uh, we have lost and are going through uh, so much right now. And of course, we, we have focused on the fact that uh, certain communities were disproportionately affected, but I do wanna lift up all communities uh, in every socioeconomic class uh, that are dealing with uh, loss and dealing with just a lot. We wanna make sure we lift up everybody's voice and stories. This week, the city entered phase one of reopening, allowing us to get a start on stabilizing our local economy. But our economy does not only depend on a biz our business operating, it also depends on the financial stability of our city's residential property taxpayers. As we all know, the coronavirus has hindered the ability of New Yorkers to meet their tax obligations over the past three months. And this issue will likely remain for many more to come. The city must act in ways to ease this burden while balancing the budget. 
as property tax payments are the biggest revenue source that funds public goods and services. My bill, preconsidered intro 6276, would defer the property tax liability on properties with an assessed value of 250,000 or less owned by certain property owners impacted by COVID-19. I want to make it clear that the $250,000 property value that is required for eligibility is the assessed value, not the market value, which is typically significantly higher for residential properties. My bill creates a deferral agreement between the city's department of finance and owners of residential property with an assessed value of up to 250,000. We have a combined income of $200,000 or less. This agreement defers July's property tax payment until October without interest or penalty unless payment is not made by October 15th. Cooperatives must demonstrate that at least 20% of the dwelling units meet the deferral agreement programs criteria. Individuals who may still struggle to pay their property li tax liability by October 15th can apply for the city, city's property tax aid program, which allows for payments to be made in installments. Preconsidered intro 6276 raises the combined income eligibility of these installment agreements from $58,300 to $200,000 <clears> for purposes of extenuating circumstances due to COVID-19. This bill will provide a significant tax relief for property owners and will apply to 99% of class one homes, 96% of co-op units, and 87% of condos. Applicants must meet the following additional criteria. They must be a property owner with said property being their primary residence, have claimed federal or state unemployment benefits for two weeks or more between March 7th and June 30th, or this year, of this year, or worked fewer than three days earning less than $504 been affected by COVID-19, including but not limited to, being personally diagnosed or a member of the household with diagnosed with COVID-19, having to provide care for a family member or a member of their household who, has, who was diagnosed with having the virus, becoming unemployed or partially unemployed because of COVID-19 or the state disaster emergency, or being unable to reach their place of employment due to the quarantine being in effect. If a person's application is denied by the city's Department of Finance, they must pay all real property taxes otherwise due on July 1st within 15 days of being notified. Preconsidered intro 6276 provides the Department of Finance to promulgate rules to allow for exceptions to these requirements. My bill does not put the onus on property owners to make themselves aware of this default agreement. Instead, it requires the Department of Finance to conduct outreach by advertising its availability. This bill requires the department to issue a report on deferral agreements, which will be published on the agency's website no later than November 1st of this year. I'd also like to take this moment to remind my colleagues in administration that renters like property owners are struggling right now. The eviction moratorium that is currently in place does not ease the financial burdens of tenants. Renters cannot be evicted, but they are still responsible for making payments and can possibly be evicted when the moratorium is over. The most impactful thing we can do to ease the stress of making payments at time when more than 90, 930,000 New Yorkers have filed for state unemployment and a large number of other jobless New Yorkers are still waiting to be approved for unemployment benefits is to provide them with real rental assistance. And I'm calling on the governor, as I've done for many weeks now, to cancel rent uh, for New Yorkers. In order for us elected officials to adequately help New Yorkers during the pandemic, we must provide them with the resources and assistance that will alleviate their financial worries and safeguard their ability to continue living in their homes. I'd like to thank Noah Brick and Rebecca Chasen from the Council's Finance Committee for their work on this bill, as well as my legislative team, Casey Addison, Director of Legislation, and Legislative Associates, Annika, Anika Michelle and Brandon Jordan. I'm eager to hear feedback of how preconsidered 6276 can be strengthened and call on the Council and administration to solidify the commitment to financial st stability of New Yorkers by supporting this bill. I really think this bill and the work that we're doing finds the right balance and keeping in mind that we have to have property taxes to do all of the good work that many of us are speaking about and many of uh, uh, New Yorkers are talking about. But it does strike the balance of having to do that, but not putting the burden on people who simply don't have the ability uh, mm -hmm. to pay it because of what happened. So thank you for this time. And I look forward to hearing the testimony from uh, the administration. Thank you so much, Public Advocate Williams. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of Council Member Helen Rosenthal, Council Member Rory Lansman, Council Member Mark Traeger, Council Member Calman Yeager, and Council Member Diana Ayala. 
Next, we will hear from Council Member Margaret Chin, followed by Council Member Mark Traeger for opening statements. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Gibson. Good morning, everyone. It is not an exaggeration to say that this pandemic had hit every part of our lives and every corner of our city. Right here in Chinatown and the Lower East Side, tenants lost their livelihood and businesses were shuttered. One outcome we have to talk about more is how small property owners have also been impacted. I represent a historic district with legacy tenement buildings and thousands of longtime rent regulated tenants who call them home. Many of them are low income immigrant seniors who pay as little as $50 in rent. Many of these buildings are owned by small family property owners who have already been struggling to keep up with the high operating expenses and property taxes for years. In Chinatown, they are owned by generation old family association. These owners are not interested in selling their buildings to larger firms and can play a critical partnership role in the city's larger effort to preserve deeply affordable housing. But they need city intervention. They haven't gotten any so far. Many mom and pop landlords who tenants have been impacted by the coronavirus are terrified of making the July 1st property tax deadline. We have to give them some breathing room. My bill will create a property tax deferral plan that allows certain property owners with COVID impact the tenants more time to pay back their July 1st bill with a dramatically reduced interest rate penalty. While we need to continue the work to secure more comprehensive relief, this is a welcoming start to make sure that this constituency is included, not neglected in our city's recovery plan. I look forward to the administration's support on this bill and hearing feedback on ways we can make this bill to help those small property owners hurting the most. I wanna thank our speaker for his support and finance staff for working on this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Chin. And now I'd like to recognize uh, my co-sponsor on intro 1952, Council Member Mark Traeger for an opening. I wanna thank Chair Gibson uh, for her leadership and for getting it and really understanding it um, and all my colleagues. I wanna say that um, there is precedent for having this tracker legislation. Um, we went through this during Superstorm Sandy when some of the hardest hit communities needed to see this level of transparency and accountability to ensure the hardest hit areas were receiving the resources um, because thus far during this pandemic, you know, a lot of folks talk about areas like Coney Island as if it's just a beach and boardwalk. Uh, it has the fifth highest death rate in the entire city of New York. We've lost over 185 souls. Um, and thus far, the decision making from this administration uh, does not seem to catch the magnitude of, of that situation. Uh, we had to fight like hell to get even a testing site. Uh, we had to fight like hell to get free mass distributions. We have to fight like hell to get basic resources. So we need to step up accountability and transparency to make sure that decisions, resources, reach the hardest hit areas of the city, like in Coney, like in parts of the Bronx, Central Brook, and other areas uh, that have been so hard hit. Um, and so I'm proud to work with Chair Vanessa Gibson, who has been a champion on this issue from day one. And we'll work very hard to advance this, this legislation to ensure that those hardest hit communities get the resources they need uh, and, and to monitor this recovery that will be, that will be continuing for, for, the, for the foreseeable future. And I thank my colleagues for, for their time. And I look forward to hearing testimony today. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you so much, Council Member Traeger. And now I will call on the members of the administration to testify. 
We will hear from Ryan Murray, our first deputy director at the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, as well as Jeffrey Scher, our deputy commissioner at the Department of Finance. Will the committee council please administer the affirmation? Thank you. I will now administer the affirmation one time and you will be called upon individually to so affirm. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Uh, Mr. Murray? I do. And Mr. Scheer? I do. Uh, thank you both. Mr. Murray, you may begin your testimony when ready, followed by Mr. Scheer. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Gibson and members of the Committee on Finance, and good morning to the Public Advocate. My name is Ryan Murray. I serve as the first Deputy Director of the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, or MOCS. Thank you for providing me this opportunity to express our support for Intro 1952, which seeks to create a database for, to track COVID-19 expenditures. As we've previously heard from my colleagues, whether at hearings, during one-on-one -on -one meetings, or through written correspondence, even with market volatility, procurement teams rapidly mobilized to respond to this pandemic, acquiring critical goods for frontline workers or to establish and enhance on-the-ground services for New Yorkers. They balance speed with risk and continue to evolve practices in response to unprecedented demands. Now, as we shift to recovery phase and efforts continue to establish a strategic stockpile of supplies that we can draw on in the face of another wave or similar emergency, we agree that it remains important for us to share information that is easy to understand and to access. For procurements, much of this data that is sought through this bill is already available online through Checkbook NYC. Checkbook NYC, an open data portal managed by the Office of the Controller, allows members of the public to easily search the full list of emergency contracts by clicking into the contract section of the portal and entering COVID-19 into the contract purpose search box. Agencies were instructed to use the standard naming convention to ensure that their procurements could easily be tracked. Each emergency contract related to COVID-19 relief is still registered and submitted to the controller's office, where it's made available for public access through Checkbook NYC. As of yesterday, a search revealed that since March 1 of this year, 210 contracts have been registered in relation to COVID-19 relief measures, totaling nearly 1.7 billion in spending. The search should produce results that include contract amounts, contracting agencies, timelines, vendors, contract purpose, award method, and more. Still, we know we can always do more to support transparency. We recognize the value of centralizing all emergency spending into a single portal to tell a more comprehensive story and ensure greater accountability. In the wake of Hurricane Sandy and the implementation of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, the city established portals which enabled various stakeholders to understand funding allocation from various sources and find projects at the local level. These efforts build confidence in recovery efforts and enhance the public discourse about how taxpayer dollars were spent. We agree with these goals and support efforts to provide similar holistic transparency to the COVID-19 emergency response and recovery. Having said that, MOX and our partners in the administration will further discuss to finalize some of the details around implementation. While information on vendor performance, for example, may be available for current vendors, the qualifications of the recipient of a grant or purchase may not readily be structured for a simple numeric display. Defining these variables and sources of greatest interest will be a critical step to publicly sharing the most helpful additional information. We look forward to continuing this conversation with the council and to strengthening the public's confidence in our overall operations. Thank you very much. Mr. Scheer. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Gibson, Public Advocate Williams, and members of the Committee on Finance. My name is Jeffrey Scheer. I am Deputy Commissioner for Treasury and Payment Services for the New York City Department of Finance. I also served last month as Finance Commissioner Jiha's representative on and secretary to the New York City Banking Commission. I am here today to testify on two council bills that address what interest rate 
the city should charge the property owners who make late payments on their New York City property taxes in tax year 2021. Property taxes are the city's biggest single source of revenue, accounting for $30 billion or nearly half of the city's total tax revenues. Without this revenue, the city would not be able to pay its employees and its vendors to provide crucial vital services to New Yorkers. This includes the provision of critical goods and services needed as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, such as personal protective equipment, medical testing equipment, ventilators, and the distribution of well over 1 million meals each day to make sure that no one goes hungry. Every year, the New York City Banking Commission is required by law to make recommendations to the council for the interest rates to be charged to property owners who do not pay property taxes when they are due. One recommendation relates to properties with an assessed value of $250,000 or less, which DOF bills quarterly. The other recommendation relates to more highly valued properties with an assessed value of over $250,000. These properties are billed semi-annually by DOF. The New York City Banking Commission considers the following when making its recommendations to the council. The city's need to encourage timely payment of property taxes, interest rates charged by other large municipalities across the country, interest rates charged for real estate secured consumer loans, and the general interest rate environment. This year, in evaluating the interest rate for properties with an assessed value of $250,000 or less, the Banking Commission placed particular emphasis on the fact that the federal funds interest rates had declined over two points over the past year largely in response to the challenge presented by the COVID-19 pandemic. Based on that decline, the Banking Commission recommended that the late payment interest rate be reduced from the FY20 rate of 7% to 5% for most of fiscal year 21. The 5% rate is significantly lower than the rate charge in other major US cities such as the 10% rate charged by Washington, D.C. However, recognizing the severe short-term impact of the pandemic, the Banking Commission went beyond this recommendation in two important ways. First, it recommended that the interest rate for late payments for the first three months of fiscal year 21 be reduced to 3.25%. This is the lowest rate that the Banking Commission is permitted to recommend by law. Second, it encouraged both the administration and the council to work together on the local law so that the city's most vulnerable property owners adversely affected by COVID-19 would not have to pay any interest for late payments in the first quarter of fiscal year 21. The pre-considered bill introduced by public advocate Williams would expand the population of property owners eligible for the 0% interest rate. In particular, it raises the income threshold to $200,000 and it includes cooperatives if 20% or more of the shareholders are affected by COVID. The administration has qualified support for this bill. We are open to raising the income threshold but we are concerned about expanding the program too much. The administration must not only look at the fiscal impact of losing interest income, but also at the impact of any program on the city's cash flow. As of Monday, June 8th, the city's cash reserve balances were $5.5 billion, but due to the normal fiscal ebbs and flows, as well as the impact of the COVID recession on the city's economy, our cash balance for the end of the fiscal year on June 30th is projected to be $2.1 billion lower than last June. 
If many property owners were to take advantage of the program by not remitting their property taxes by the interest-free due date of July 1st, the city's cash position later in fiscal year 21 could become extremely stressed. We support instead basing criteria for hardship on DOF's existing property tax and interest deferral program, the PTA program that authorizes payment plans for property owners with incomes under $58,399 who are facing extenuating circumstances. These plans limit the percentage of income that an affected property owner must pay to between 2% and 8% of the property owner's income and allows property taxes not addressed by these payments to be deferred. The deferred taxes continue to accrue interest. Property owners who reside at their properties with income below $58,399 could get 0% interest, effectively a 90-day grace period if a household member became seriously ill or passed away as a result of COVID-19, or if the household suffered the loss of income as a result of COVID-19. We are more concerned regarding the pre-considered bill for properties with an assessed value of over $250,000. The properties in this category account for about 70% of the $30 billion in property tax revenue. For more than two decades, properties in this category pay 18% interest on late property tax payments due to the city's heavy reliance on this revenue. The Banking Commission's recommendation um, is to continue this rate for fiscal year 21. The council bill reduces the interest rate to 7.5% instead of eliminating interest, and it does require affected property owners to pay one quarter of the taxes due by October 1st and the remainder by May 1st, 2021. However, the bill would allow any commercial owner or landlord to receive the benefit if it experienced any drop of income between March 1st and June 30th due to COVID-19. The vast majority of businesses would qualify regardless of the size of the property and the amount of taxes due. Even if a fraction of eligible businesses opted into this program, the city's cash position would likely be severely affected. DOF and the administration are willing to work with the council on defining a reduced population of small businesses to be potentially eligible for this benefit. Until that is done, we cannot support this bill. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Mayor's Office of Contract Services and the Department of Finance for providing testimony on today's agenda and our three bills. I'd also like to announce the presence of Council Member Adrian Adams and Council Member Robert Cornegy. Um, thank you again, gentlemen. I wanna begin by asking, uh, few questions related to the city's management of tracking COVID spending. Um, which office or agency does the administration anticipate will create and maintain the tracker uh, contemplated by our intro in 1952? Thank you for the question, uh, Chair. So we're not there yet in terms of uh, being able to tell you who's gonna manage it specifically, but those conversations are ongoing but you can imagine who the contributors are, right? So uh, using the data that's already established with Checkbook NYC, we'll make sure that us and OMB uh, are tracking all the procurements and spending appropriately. Uh, the, you, in the bill, I believe, expressed an interest in making sure that loans and grants are also tracked. So there's some uh, effort there for SBS to contribute, but we'll, we're gonna come back to you on who exactly would be the ones managing this. I know you're on a quick, you want us to be on a quick timeline to get this up and running. So heard you loud and clear. Uh, we will make sure that we establish that in short order. Okay. And can you just remind my colleagues and I who did the Sandy tracker and the 2009 federal stimulus tracker? Sure. Uh, I believe the folks behind that, uh, it was a combination of people contributing. Our folks at operations collaborated obviously with folks that do it, I believe. 
our analytics people had a hand in that before, um, but that may not mean those are the exact folks that would manage this going forward, but we have the model, we know the inputs, um, and we would wanna spend some time with you also making sure we have the right data. Okay, so you said the Mayor's Office of Operations and Do It were involved in the Sandy Tracker? Uh, yeah, those were some of the folks that were previously involved. Uh, our folks at Data Analytics were involved, uh, but there are a lot of contributors here. So um, we're not, uh, I'm not in a position today to say that those are the exact folks that would manage this moving forward. The administration's always reorganizing itself to make sure that uh, we meet our goals and timelines. Your interest, as we understand it, is to do this quickly. Um, so not spend, you know, an inordinate amount of time thinking about who should manage it, but make some decisions quickly and get it up and running. So um, we, we are, we're prepared to make sure we get you a firm answer um, in short order. And I see the bill also includes a recommendation to have that happen within 90 days. So uh, we will make sure that that happens. Okay. Uh, do you know uh, what roles MOX and both OMB play in monitoring COVID-19 spending? for our city agencies and logging data in the FSM system or an alternative system? Sure, so uh, each agency, as you know, uh, is responsible for their direct perturbance and spending. Uh, what Mox and OMB collaborated to do at the, you know, whether it was in February, retraining agencies, uh, how to account for this appropriately so that we can maximize our reimbursements, that was OMB's job. We at Mox were also responsible for making sure that agencies understood how to justify uh, the procurement. So the litmus test for all of us is, if not for COVID, would you be spending this money? That's the bottom line. Um, in terms of tracking and coding, obviously this stuff goes into FMS, uh, the, the city's financial management system. We ask agencies to ensure that there are budget codes, uh, CV for example, um, that, are, that was coded for each of these things in the line items. And thus, when we got to a point of uh, reviewing that in FMS, uh, you know, controller's office and uh, OMB made sure that those things were coded appropriately, hitting the right budget lines, so that those would show up in checkbook. So checkbook is the public display site where folks, as I mentioned, my testimony can go today and, and you know, run a search for contracts, for example, and other expenses. Uh, but on our side, uh, we're talking about FMS and uh, the grants management system would also be the place this is uh, on be hosted where we make sure that we're tracking uh, anything that's incoming. So all of that, the intent is to make sure that that goes similar to Sandy, similar to the, uh, the recovery money uh, to a site where it's not just data output, but easy to understand and track as much as possible at the local level. Okay, so that was my next question on categorizing, but you answered it. So as one example, our school meals that have been distributed at the, many of the grab and go sites across the city, they're not tagged as COVID spending in the budget currently. So how will you be able to go back when you're creating a tracker to ensure that everything is included? Sure, so that will be part of the, the design process here, right? Um, the things that are showing up today and that have been already checked, then those are set. If there are particular uh, depending on how those are coded, depending on how uh, DOE and, and, and OMB agrees, uh, things should be established in terms of uh, for reimbursement from the feds. Uh, we would work with, with those agencies to just make sure that those are, if it needs to be recoded, that that happens. Uh, I'm not as familiar with that specific budget line or every budget line of the agencies today, but we, that would be part of what we're looking at. And we would go back, for example, if something isn't today coded and it should be, particularly when you're thinking reimbursement, uh, reimbursement recode appropriately, uh, make sure that it follows all the uh, the federal guidelines for, for uh, emergency. Right. That's the other thing, right? This is not just saying it's COVID. Of course, it's supporting our response here, but does it meet the guidelines established by the feds for reimbursement? And, and therefore that's the coding we would pursue. So it would be a collaborative process with OMB and the agencies uh, they're already doing that on the front end. If, for example, uh, again, I don't have DOE in front of me right now, but if you're seeing that DOE isn't showing up for some reason, happy to look into that. That'll be something that we pick up in the design process. Okay, I have another example. It's been a very popular conversation recently. Uh, the police department's overtime spending. Uh, do you know if all of that is FEMA eligible? And if so, how is this parsed for purposes of the federal claiming through FEMA? Right, I'll have to get back to you on this, this specific okay. one with OMB. 
But that, that kind of thing is exactly from whether it's OTPS, right, or PS side, um, we would look, okay. be looking into that. So I'll, I'll commit to getting back to you with that, uh, with OMB. Okay, sounds good. Uh, I had a question on the decision-making process on our COVID contracts, specifically sure. around MWBEs. Uh, Council member Carnegie and many others talk um, about how we need to incorporate our MWBEs during this recovery and healing process. So mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, uh, DCAS has a $1.5 billion fiscal 2021 budget for COVID related purchases on behalf of direct service agencies. Meanwhile, OEM has around $400 million, which has gone largely towards our hotel program that provides free hotel stays for eligible New Yorkers and frontline healthcare workers. Um, so my question is, how did the city leverage its size to reduce the cost per unit of PPE and actual hotel rooms? Would you be able to answer that? Uh, I, so I can answer that uh, generally and refer okay. back to some testimony that was uh, provided previously by uh, Commissioner Camilo. So just to pull back here, um, as I said in my testimony and as we've discussed, well, not you and Wait, we lost you. Sorry, I think I went on mute for some reason. Yeah, okay, yes, right. okay. So, <laughs> let me start over. Um, I, I think uh, the Commissioner Camillo has previously covered uh, at her hearing, and uh, this has been a point of discussion. We, in terms of procurement during, during the COVID, uh, you know, the early days and through the peak of the epidemic, um, had a lot of income in from all sorts of sources. I'm happy to follow up with you on how much money has been uh, spent on MWBEs thus far. I know that the administration does have those data, uh, but for example, um, with DCAS and, and our team, there are a number of entities that you know, you've heard the public calls for folks to come to us uh, if they had reliable sources. So in terms of our buying and purchasing power, we the, the first mission for us was to get stuff to the front lines from any source that was available and deemed capable of, of producing those goods, right? Whether it was face masks or gloves or gowns. So this was a matter for us. This was not normal times. Uh, get stuff to the front lines. Right. We're, in a different, we're in a different phase now where I think uh, we could be even more discerning than we've evolved or practiced to be. So for example, we already have numbers of orders where I can't say we're good in every category every day because that changes, right? We still haven't seen a full stabilization of the supply line. But know that one of the things that DCAS has done, for example, and other agencies, is if there are existing vendors that they have contracts with that have proven over the last couple months to deliver, some of those may be being MWBEs, they're gonna make sure they keep tapping that to build a strategic, strategic stockpile. So to council member Carnegie's interest specifically in the task force, um, I'm happy to get back to you with the specific numbers on MWBEs. Um, there are millions of dollars that have gone into MWBE contracts throughout the, uh, the pandemic. Um, agencies have available to them the increased small purchase threshold, as you know, um, so that there's more discretion in terms of specific buying going to MWBEs. Every business that we work with, including MWBEs, was affected their own supply chain in getting things here. So, um, you know, we weren't talking about normal times uh, and, and, you know, we, we're going to go to our, our, our favorite MWBE tomorrow to tap them, even in doing so, uh, you know, if they weren't able because their supply line is in China, for example, right, uh, mm -hmm. and couldn't get stuff here, we went to any and every source because the mission is to get stuff to New Yorkers in the front lines. Now, I think uh, you'll see there, we will be uh, doing as much as possible to continue working with MWBEs and making sure we get supplies here. So the threshold exists, it's much higher, up to $500,000 at present. We will be using that across uh, our goods and services portfolio as we look to recovery. So that's a commitment that the administration can, continues to have. Okay, great. So I definitely, um, on behalf of my colleagues and I, we definitely wanna understand more about the outreach efforts to MWBEs. Uh, to ensure that they have further access during this recovery process. 
and sure. what we can do as a council to help you. I think when you look at out of boroughs, particularly like my borough of the Bronx and many other places, businesses have been struggling for quite some time. Even the ones that were open, people think that they were making so much money in terms of revenue and profit, but they were barely surviving. They were essential services, but they were maintaining a staff. Sometimes they had to hire more staff. So we just wanna make sure that our outreach efforts are as expansive as they possibly can be as we move forward over the next several weeks and months. Absolutely, okay? we, we're, we're committed to that. And we have the discretion to uh, go directly to MWBEs in, and we will be making sure that we do that in partnership with you. Uh, agencies uh, are required to let uh, uh, MWBEs know the types of uh, services and commodities that they're purchasing from. And it is our expectation that they leverage um, that purchase method. We are ramping up. Um, we know that we're in a digital space. So to the extent that folks can uh, submit uh, proposals online, uh, that's what we're doing starting right now. We just trained agencies at Mox yesterday, uh, started off the series to make sure that they're able to use our procurement and sourcing solutions portal uh, once we go live in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so that they can get, you know, get messaging out to MWBEs, get those bids and proposals in through that portal. Um, and we hope that that reduces the barriers to entries uh, for many MWBEs. So happy to partner with you on outreach, making sure agencies are putting all the notices up so they know the kinds of things that are, uh, are being purchased. And we want to make sure it's easier to do so and participate uh, by MWBEs by going digital. Okay, great. I have a question on the tracking new COVID related projects. Um, much of the need and attention in COVID-19 related spending has really been focused on the expense side of the city's budget. Um, however, capital COVID-19 spending has been happening as well. As an example, the huge purchase of iPads for all of our thousands of students to re re learn remotely. Um, and that also needs to be tracked as well. So I wanted to understand from your perspective, how are we tracking those capital purchases um, and what would that look like in the tracking system? Yeah, it, it'll be similar to the, the, the other, kind, the expense side of the house. I know you have a particular interest in capital, obviously. Okay. Um, but <laughs> uh, we would be using uh, the CV code, uh, OMB as instructed agencies as such. Um, and you should, uh, as in the next couple of weeks, as we're working through that with agencies, start to see those things turn up uh, in, in our trackers. So uh, there, it similarly, will be coded, will be available to you. Uh, so you should see that soon. Okay, great. Uh, when we tracked uh, Superstorm Sandy tracking, uh, each of our Sandy related projects, the ID had the word SAND, S-A-N-D in the name. Um, mm -hmm. I'm wondering, are we going to follow suit and implement a similar naming convention when creating project IDs for COVID? Sure, so uh, okay. you're, you're, you're there. Uh, yes, uh, we will be. That is part of the instructions in terms of naming convention. Um, and you will see as we work together uh, on the, the portal that that will be so. So there will be uh, CV is the current uh, uh, code that is being used, so just two letters for COVID, okay. um, but we will be working with you on that and, and you will see that turn up similar, yes. Okay, great. Um, outside of the capital spending on the computers for DOE that I mentioned, uh, do, are you aware of any of the things the city's been spending on capital dollars for COVID related purposes? I, I'll have to get back to you on this one. Um, again, uh, because it only is making sure that folks are coding these things appropriately now. Uh, we're, we, will, you, we should be able to provide you with that information and you should see it turn up. Um, I'm not currently aware of all the things that they're spending on, which I think is your question, um, but this goes exactly to the bill that you're proposing, right? You wanna make sure that this information is readily available. You don't just have to ask me. Um, it'll be publicly accessible by you. So um, happy to follow up and happy to make sure that that makes its way into uh, the portal. Okay, great. Um, as you continue to talk to agencies, is there any particular guidance or metrics that are provided to agencies on how they should create COVID-19 related capital projects in the city's uh, FMS system? Are you guys having those conversations at this point? Yeah, yeah. so I think this all goes to the full uh, 
training that agencies are and, and monitoring that OMB is putting in place, um, you know, C, using CV-19, for example, and making sure that it's actually a capital eligible uh, expense as always, that is the OMB's role. Um, and again, making sure that these things um, fit with the federal guidance, guidance for reimbursement. So that's the, the sum total of the effort um, in the monitoring and tracking and reporting side. Um, and you know, again, the portal should reflect these data. Okay, great. Um, I'm now going to turn over to the Department of Finance because I have a few questions about the property tax deferral bill. So thank you so much. Um, stay tuned. My colleagues have questions for you as well. Um, I have a question regarding the Banking Commission recommendations. Um, this year, our Banking Commission recommended a 5% late payment rate for properties with assessed values of $250,000 or less with a 3.25 rate in the first quarter. Um, so my question is, um, can you describe the commission's rationale for these historically low recommended rates? Yes. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so, um, as I indicated in my testimony, the um, Banking Commission considered the city's need to encourage timely payment of property taxes, interest rates charged by other large municipalities across the country, interest rates charged for real estate secured consumer loans, and, and in particular, um, the general interest rate environment. And I think the, the heart uh, of your question is that the decline in interest rates which had dropped over 2% since the previous year, and in large part was due to the response to the COVID um, pandemic, um, is what influenced the Banking Commission to recommend first the 2% decrease in the interest rate from 7%, which is the current rate for mm -hmm. properties assessed under 250,000 to the 5%, and then um, went one step further and looked at the impact of the pandemic right now and um, expected it, um, to be in the first quarter of fiscal year 21 and recommended the lower 3.25% rate, um, which as I indicated is the lowest rate that the Banking Commission is permitted to recommend by law. Okay, okay, I understand. Um, so despite the recommended reduction in the rate for quarterly property taxpayers, the commission left the recommended rate for large semi-annual property taxpayers unchanged uh, at 18%, uh, leaving many, many small business property owners and owners of many rental properties without any proposed relief um, amidst a volatile liquidity uh, position. So I'm wondering why the commission chose not to make any recommendations for lower interest rates with respect to those who are semi-annual taxpayers? Yes. So the commission was looking at how dependent the city is on the revenue that comes from the higher valued properties, properties with an assessed value of over $250,000. 70% of the $30 billion a year that the city receives um, in property tax revenues comes from this category. And the city absolutely must have the vast majority of these funds in order to continue to provide the services that the citizens need, especially during this time of COVID. And, and frankly, the city's dependence on property taxes generally and on the higher valued properties payment of taxes is why the interest rate has been at this level for over two decades. Well, you said 70%. Are you hearing concerns from semi-annual payers about their inability to make the upcoming July 1st payment? We are. And I, I guess before going further, I want to say that we very much agree with 
the tone and the content of, of your opening remarks here, Gibson. So we favor creating targeted assistance. We are looking to balance the targeted assistance against the fiduciary responsibility to ensure um, that the city is able to um, fund its budget. Well, I think that many of my colleagues will acknowledge and understand that, you know, these are the ratepayers that we're hearing from and everyone is struggling. And so I appreciate the efforts to provide relief for some uh, ratepayers, but we have to take care of all the others as well. And I think we all understand the cash flow problem that we're having in the city. Uh, that's why this budget process is going to be so challenging and painful. But I think the relief has to be the greatest for our you know, property taxpayers when many of them have not been given relief in the past. Uh, there was no time like the present. And certainly I and my colleagues, we really understand, but I think it's something that we really have to look into more in depthly since you're already acknowledging that you're hearing from many of these taxpayers already about July 1st, which is around the corner. Yes, so that is acknowledged. We are hearing from taxpayers. We have more um, taxpayers who are contacting us regarding some of our existing programs, exemption programs, the PTA program that you mentioned. And I do want to point out, since it wasn't in my testimony, that we do have standard payment plans for people who are unable to pay their property taxes. So we acknowledge that we are getting those inquiries. And frankly, we are looking to a uh, more in-depth conversation with the council to create a program that creates the same type of balancing that you spoke about. Okay, we appreciate that. We will continue to follow up with you. Um, the last question I have for you related to this is the city's cash flow challenge. Um, our ability to manage cash flow is a real problem. It's a real realistic problem right now. Um, if our city has access to low interest rates on short-term borrowing, and by that, I mean borrowing to manage cash flow issues, not long-term borrowing to balance the budget, essentially, is this something the administration would consider utilizing to help our struggling small businesses and our property owners? So I have to defer to OMB on that. It's my understanding that the administration is looking at borrowing options um, at this time that does not appear to be an option or, or um, the, the state and the federal government have not indicated that those are options. And so we are having to look at the budget under um, current circumstances. But again, I, I would defer um, to, to OMB on the particulars of that. Um, I do want to point out, since you reference the um, managing the cash balances, that um, as I said earlier, um, the cash balances for this year at the end of the fiscal year are projected to be $2 billion lower than last June. And the city has already spent over $2 billion on COVID-19 related costs and expects to spend up to $3 billion by the end of this calendar year. Um, and that these costs are supported with the city's cash until we receive reimbursement from FEMA, which is a significant drain on the city's cash balances. And as of today, we have not received any reimbursement for these critical costs um, to respond and mitigate the pandemic. Okay, okay. And I do wanna make sure I'm going on a record that I did acknowledge and say short-term borrowing and not long-term borrowing, correct? <laughs> you, you most certainly did do that, Chair Gibson. Okay, great. Okay, I, I um, am finished with my round one of questions and I will turn it over to the sponsors of the bills on today's agenda and then the remainder of my colleagues that have questions for both MOX and Department of Finance. I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Robert Cornegie, Council Member Adrian Adams, Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, Council Member Brad Lander, and Council Member Mark Joni.
And now I don't believe the public advocate is no longer with us. So now I will turn to council member Margaret Chin for questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Chair, um, one of the things that you raised earlier about the bill was any drop of income. Uh, I want to make a correction. Uh, in the bill, if the drop of income have to exceed their July 1st tax bill. So it's not just any drop. Uh, so I think, you know, that is something uh, we want to make sure that uh, you know that it's in the bill. And we also want to work with the administration on, you know, setting up a threshold. What I really want to stress is that, you know, there's this whole constituency that are what I talked about earlier in my opening remarks um, are these legacy building, tenement building. Um, they're not the big guys. And they have been providing affordable housing in our city for decades and decades, but they're not getting any relief. I mean, we try doing, working with the Department of Finance or how, how to help these people, you know, their building get assessed and values as higher because of, you know, gentrification, but they're not getting the income. And now because of the pandemic, a lot of the commercial uh, tenants that are in these buildings are closed. And a lot of these buildings depend on the commercial tenants rent to pay property tax. They need help. And I don't think the city is really recognizing how desperately uh, that they need help. Don't lump them together with the big guys. I mean, there's big commercial building, commercial landlord, they could afford to pay. And the city should encourage them to pay their property tax early. I mean, I think we did that in the 70s. And so there is precedent. But the thing is that, what are we doing to help uh, these legacy tenant, tenement bill who are providing affordable housing in neighborhoods across the city. Um, and when you talk about uh, programs that you have, I mean, what kind of outreach uh, Department of Finance is doing uh, to really reach out these owner to see how we can give them some relief. But from what I'm hearing, from property owners in my district, they're not getting any help. And that's why they're desperate because the July 1st tax bill is due. And 18% late charge is a lot of money. And they're lumped together with the big guys. And the bill at least like lowered the interest rate to show, to give them some breathing room. And we're also, they also have to pay part of the property tax, right? So it's not like you pay nothing. You still have to pay. We're asking that you, part of you have to pay 25%. And then you, you pay another 25% later, at least to give them some breathing room. But the assessment of property tax, these are long-term you know, things that need to be changed, how certain property are assessed. So, you know, my question to you is that what's the city and Department of Finance doing to help these small property owner, these legacy owner, these family association owner who don't want to sell their building to speculator? And they're the one that's providing affordable housing. Yes. So council member Chin, the Department of Finance wants to work with you and the council on um, amending the bill that's been introduced. We hear you. We agree that there's a need to provide targeted assistance. We do think there's a further conversation needed to ensure that the assistance, as you say, is for the, the struggling smaller owners uh, and trying to differentiate that from owners that may not be, may have lost income, but may not be struggling and owners that are paying, um, are, are owning very highly valued properties. 
and we look forward to having that conversation with you. I do want to say that the Department of Finance does a significant amount of outreach concerning its existing programs. So that is the um, PTA program that we've discussed earlier, um, our exemption programs. Um, we have exemption programs for um, senior citizen homeowners, for veterans, um, for disabled homeowners. And um, if you don't feel like we are doing sufficient outreach, oh, and also we do outreach on our standard payment plans for property owners that um, all property owners are eligible for um, without regard to um, size of property or income. So if you don't feel like we are doing enough outreach in your district, then we want to be sitting down with you and discussing how we can enhance our outreach. Well, the main thing is also how the assessment is done. I think that's the biggest uh, issue that's been raised by these property owners. I mean, the way that their building is being assessed. I mean, you have like similar buildings and similar size and, and you know, because there's a renovation done next door, then their assessment goes up. So there's a lot of unfairness that's been going on for years. And like, we need to find ways of bringing some relief. Um, and then on the question that Chair Gibson raised uh, in terms of the, the short-term borrowing um, for the cash flow, that's nothing new. I mean, during the Bloomberg administration and the Blasio administration, it was used um, you know, by the adopted budget. I mean, they, so I think that's something that the administration probably will be looking at uh, to uh, help with the cash flow. I mean, we understand that, you know, the property tax is the only way that the city you know, get the money. I mean, so we know how important it is, but we just want some fairness and also to recognize that, you know, property owner who provide affordable housing needs relief. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Chin. And now we'll have Council Member Mark Traeger for questions. Council Member Traeger, are you with us? I see you're muted and your camera is off. Okay, if Council Member Traeger is not with us, can, can we go to the next council member that has questions? Okay, uh, can, we have questions from Council Member Yeager, please. Council Member Yeager, your time will begin now. There we go. Can we unmute the camera? There we go. There we go. Yeah, I'm good. Sorry about that. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. Good to see you up there. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, I, I have uh, just a few questions, but uh, I just want to begin very briefly. Um, last year, uh, for the last two years that I've been in the council, I voted against the interest rates, uh, the 7% and the 18%. Uh, and last year, when those two resolutions came before the council, it wasn't just me alone. It was um, 11 of us uh, voted against the 18%. Seven of us voted, uh, 13 of us voted against the 7%. So there, there is a feeling in the council that these interest rates are usurious, I think uh, is how I describe it. I continue to describe it. I think it's loan sharking. Um, and I think, it's, uh, I think it's unfair to New Yorkers. But uh, now more than ever, I think we can do a little better. Uh, and while I'm pleased by the recommendation of the banking commission for a lower rate, I don't think it's enough. Uh, first, I don't believe that the city should monetize and profiteer off the misery of New Yorkers who can't afford to pay their bills. People who are not paying their property taxes are not doing it because they don't feel like paying their property taxes. They're not paying their property taxes because they can't. And that's a very, very important distinction. And I think that we need to recognize that there are all kinds of people in New York who need help. And some of those people are people who own properties. Um, uh, the Secondly, uh, the reduction uh, from you know, seven to five to 3.25, you know, three and a quarter percent, I would love to know which bank in this city is paying the city of New York three and a quarter percent to keep its money on deposit. 
that we can't afford to do a little better for the people. Um, and obviously, if people can't pay, uh, if people can pay, they ought to be able to pay, they ought to pay. But, uh, and, we, and I agree that we do want to encourage the timely payment of property taxes where possible. But when we can't, um, I think it's important to remember this program, these two uh, pre-considered intros um, uh, by the public advocate and uh, council member Chin, a very forward thinking ways of trying to help New Yorkers. Um, I'm a little surprised that the administration is not holding our hands and side by side with us on this. And I think we can do a little better. Uh, first, it's important to remember, this is not an abatement, a cancellation, a reduction, it's not a rebate. This is merely a deferral. The city's gonna get its money, just not today. Um, it's a temporary delay in the payment. I also want to point out that these bills and the city's programs do nothing to deal with the April missed payments. There are people who lost their jobs um, or who suffered immediate uh, financial loss from tenancies who cannot pay, who were not able to pay the April payments. And to this day, every single day, they're accumulating interest on those payments. These bills do not do anything to go backwards into the current fiscal year that we're in now. It's simply forward looking into the July payment, and I think we can do better on that as well. Um, and frankly, this cost the city nothing to do. It cost the city not a penny because the money remains on the books as, as income that the city ultimately will receive. It's just not receiving it today. It'll get it in three months, four months, six months, whenever it gets it, but it's going to get it. And the idea that we have to charge interest, um, I, think, uh, I think we can do uh, a little better. Um, and that's why I, I think the imposition of interest uh, to begin with is, is insulting, and I think we ought to be able to do a little better. Uh, I will also point out that the council has not yet taken up the two annual resolutions on the interest rates. I would urge uh, my colleagues here in finance um, and throughout the council to really look hard whether or not we want to authorize the city uh, to impose these, these high interest rates on New Yorkers. Um, and, you know, the, the last thing uh, with regard to these bills, and as I said, I'm very, very grateful to uh, Councilmember Chin, to the public advocate for uh, forwarding these bills and, and advancing them onto the floor uh, through this hearing. I hope we were able to move them soon. I would just like to point out um, that, that the, there is a series of applications uh, that needs to be done in order to avail themselves. And, and one of the things that Councilmember Chin pointed out is that, um, you know, it's not, we're not asking people uh, to pay, we're, we're, we're asking people to simply say that the income that was lost exceeds the amount of payment that they would have had to make. Um, it's not, it doesn't need to be a, a, a great series of auditing to get, that, to get to that point. I think we can do better than, than asking people to come in with all kinds of records. I think people should all, simply be able to certify. Do they need this program or not? Remember, we're only talking about about a year of payments, maybe just a couple of months. If they need the program, check off here, sign at the bottom, send it in. You won't get a bill for a little while. It'll give people some breathing room. People in the city are desperate for help. I also want to remind um, not just the agency, but just the, in general, the, my colleagues, the, the New Yorkers who keep on talking about canceling rent, we have to do something for our tenants. I'm a tenant, um, I'm doing okay and I can pay my rent, but people in the city are bleeding. They cannot afford to pay their rent. We have to do I'm expired. I know my time is up, Madam Chair. I'm gonna wrap up in a moment. Um, if we are talking about doing something for the tenants, we have to be able to recognize that on the other side of that tenant is a landlord who has to maintain the building, pay their staff, um, and obviously pay the city of New York its taxes. So we have to do it on both sides. We have to help the landlords, we have to help the tenants. We must help both sides of the equation in order to, to, to prevent the collapse of the real estate market and the economy. Um, as Council Member Chin said, these are the people who are paying the bills. Uh, it, it, the city needs the money in order to function, but we have to do it in a way that enables people to actually be able to pay their bills. So there were no questions there, um, but I will leave you this, Mr. Chair, if you can. Uh, if, do you happen to know, um, Madam Chair, and I thank you, uh, this is my only question, I thank you for your uh, uh, indulgence. Do you happen to know uh, how many or as a percentage or some kind of number that gives us an indication of how many people had trouble paying the April uh, payment? I don't have that with me. We can get back to you with that information. Uh, I can say that um, the April payments seem, while there were people, and we acknowledge that, who had difficulty paying, uh, it appears that for many, 
the amounts had already been escrowed by their mortgage companies. So the payments were, were fairly robust. Yeah, but and, we'll, and we'll, we'll share what we have with you on that. If you can, and one other thing that I'll remind you, and this will be my last point, is, is when the banks make the payments on behalf of, of, of the mortgagees, um, it, uh, it, it, the, the banks are laying out the money in many cases. Um, if we don't authorize uh, a reduction, an abatement, uh, 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 a deferral, together with an interest rate reduction to zero, banks are going to lay out this money and they're going to get turned to the mortgagors, to, to the property owners, and say, you, you owe us this money now, and the banks are going to impose interest. We have to do something to stop that from happening. My guess is that, for the most part, April payments were made based on payments that were being escrowed between February, January, February, and March during the mortgage payments. Starting in March and April, people started having difficulty making their mortgage payments. That's where I think we see the pain. And so I think we have to address April. I certainly believe, uh, as Council Member Chin, Public Advocate of Advance, that we have to begin addressing this in a real way for the July payments, which are coming due in literally five minutes. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Madam Chair, again. Thank you, Council Member Yeager. Uh, I have a few more questions. Um, I'm awaiting Council Member Traeger, who does have questions on intro 1952. Uh, I had a question on business tax deferrals. Um, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, finance allowed COVID impacted businesses to defer their tax year 2019 business taxes um, and waived all penalties, but still charged interest. Do you guys know how many deferrals that, uh, that DOF has granted for this program so far? And do you have an estimate of how much in taxes uh, DOF has deferred as part of this particular program? So I don't have the figures and, and we'll uh, need to get back to you with, with what okay. we have thus far. Um, your description is correct. Um, we did um, we did not delay payments, but we did abate um, the penalties uh, and we continue to charge interest. Okay, is this program still ongoing? I believe so. Okay, so do you know by chance uh, what proof a business had to provide to show that they were impacted by COVID? Was that what you were mentioning in your testimony as far as having a relative or a staff member affected? Is that the same criteria? I don't believe it was the same criteria. We'll get back to you with that. Okay, um, and do you know, was cash flow a consideration when the department authorized the penalty-free business tax deferral program? I would imagine yes, right? <laughs> yes, so I, I cash flow is always a consideration. It is especially a uh, prominent consideration when we're dealing with property taxes because they are just so much larger. They're such a bigger part of the city's budget. Okay. And what's the interest rate for this particular program? Do you know? So the interest rate for business taxes is currently 9%. And I believe that um, based on the law, it's scheduled to drop to 7.5% on July 1st. 75 okay. And how long is this deferral period? I can't tell you that. I'm not familiar with that. Okay, well, if you could follow up, we'll follow up with you. We use, we'll okay. send out a letter just uh, affirming all of the questions and just follow up with the agency. Okay. Understood. Okay. Um, I have a question on geographical tracking that I wanted to ask. Um, it would be helpful if the proposed database that the council is recommending would allow the public to see how COVID-19 funding is allocated based on different geographic uh, parameters. Um, I want to know, is this something the administration would include in the funding tracker? And I ask that because if you look across the city of New York and the impact that COVID has had, it has hit communities of color the hardest, African-American and Latino New Yorkers, older New Yorkers 60 and over. Um, certain communities were affected more than others. And now as we are getting out of COVID and we're on the road to recovery, 
it's really important that the spending that we do and invest in communities, it has to be the communities that were the greatest in need and the greatest challenge. Um, and so to me, this criteria that we're asking for is really helpful because the data that we're seeing now in terms of COVID deaths, we have it categorized by zip code, by neighborhood. We know the residents in public housing. We've asked for data on LGBT New Yorkers. So we're looking at data from multiple perspectives to understand where the greatest challenges were and how we can go back into those communities to provide a lot of relief. So my question is, will the administration consider including uh, geographic parameters in the funding tracker? Yes, we will consider that. It reflects the approach that we had for the Sandy tracker that's online, um, as you know, where we're able to look. At, obviously, that would probably vary by project, so I don't want to speak ahead of the folks who will be working on this, um, but it is something that obviously is very important to be able to say which communities are getting uh, the support uh, based on the impact that has been had uh, with COVID. So it's something we would consider, yes. Okay, and you do acknowledge and agree that those communities most impacted by COVID should get a majority of the further investments, correct? I, I believe the administration has said that previously um, in, in various forums. So um, I, I'm sure, don't, again, don't wanna get ahead of OMB, but that is a principle that makes sense to me. Okay. I have a question on our federal claiming process. Um, okay. With billions of dollars at stake, it's critical that we all understand how the city is claiming what we are owed from the federal government. Um, starting at the beginning, what is the city's internal process for identifying spending that may be eligible for federal reimbursement? So I, I'll go back to some of the points that we covered uh, up front. Um, the, Guide, the training that's been provided to agencies uh, at the outset in February based on what we've done previously uh, with Sandy, for example, was to make sure that uh, their, their, this spending would not be exist if it wasn't for COVID. So again, that's the litmus test. Uh, the coding that happened um, with the CV, for example, or CV-19, uh, tracking an FMS is the way in which we're able to uh, go back in time uh, and be able to note what, what's appropriate. There at OMB, there is a grants tracker um, that exists where we're, that's what we're going to be using to ensure that we uh, can claim appropriately. Uh, where it's major uh, funding streams like FEMA uh, and so mm -hmm. on, obviously that's very tightly managed by OMB uh, across the agencies where uh, there are specific uh, funding streams that each agency is very familiar with. There's more of a monitoring approach there. So coordination centrally it happens. It's going to be via the grants tracking uh, system that exists and the coding of that. Folks have been trained on it. Um, and you should see in the claiming process, which I can't speak to it in, in more detail than this today, um, the intent is to then use those guidelines the grants tracking system to get the reimbursements. Uh, there should be few legitimate reasons why we don't get there um, when we're working with the federal government. Okay, and what is going to be the central database for capturing information on COVID relating spending across all of the agencies? Is it going to be the FMS system? The FMS remains the, the system that tracks everything. That is that's okay. the place where everything happens. Um, but to your, your interest and intent, uh, we want to be able to pull that stuff out uh, and make it uh, public, publicly available in a different way. Checkbook captures it now, but I think what, based on what you're uh, indicating, you want to be able to make it more understandable by the public to increase discourse. Um, and so folks can understand um, on the ground, here's how my community uh, is, was affected and is, the response is happening. So. Uh, I think the tracker that you're proposing with the bill should achieve all those goals, but FMS is the system of record. Uh, the grants management system is the system that's being used uh, to track claiming. Um, and, and, and there's lots of guidance in agencies to make sure that they're doing that well. Okay, great. Um, do you have an idea of how long it would take to reconcile the books for our fiscal 2020 expenses? 
Uh, I will have to defer to OMB on that. Okay, great. And then another follow-up, um, probably would have to get back to us as well. Um, wondering if there's any reason why federal aids in fiscal 2020 might not be rolled into fiscal 2021. Yeah, I think that's a more technical question that I would uh, okay. get an answer to you on. Okay, great. Um, I am done with my questions. I think some of my colleagues may have other questions, but I simply wanted to thank uh, the both of you for answering all of our questions. I'm excited about the COVID spending tracker system. I think it's important for New Yorkers to understand uh, during this pandemic, all of the funds that we're talking about, whether it's federal reimbursements or just general city spending dollars, where that money is going, um, certainly on behalf of my community in the Bronx, uh, that was very, very hard hit. We definitely appreciate the opportunity to see it from a geographical perspective, neighborhood by neighborhood, um, because I do think that you know many, many communities across the city, particularly communities in, of color and immigrant communities, uh, there are health challenges and disparities and underlying healthcare issues that many New Yorkers have been affected by that were further exacerbated with a COVID uh, diagnosis. Um, and so if the city is going to rebound, if we're really going to have a real response, not just supporting businesses and returning back to normal, um, the spending and how we designate dollars is going to be very, very critical um, for those communities that have felt shortchanged, left behind, underinvested, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I look forward to working with you and the administration on this implementation and how we address some of the uh, deficiencies and gaps in service, uh, because I think the tracking system can really shed light on where all the money is going and how we are providing the reinvestment that are needed in, in our communities. So I thank Absolutely. you for that. Equity has uh, to be I'm a part of the response. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn our hearing back over to our council to call council members for further questions. Thank you. We will next hear from council member uh, Mark Jonai. Uh, in addition, if other council members have questions for the administration, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be added to the queue. Um, council members, you'll be given five minutes, including answers. Please wait for the sergeant at arms to tell you when your time begins. The sergeant will then let you know when your time is up. Um, is council member Jonai ready? Council member Jonai, okay. time starts now. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I want to echo some of the sentiments from my colleagues. Uh, there's a report that was just recently re released by the National Bureau of Economic Research, and it shows businesses that were impacted by COVID-19 by ethnicities and demographics nationally. The Black business owners were hit with the highest rate, 41% while immigrant-owned businesses, 36, Latino businesses, 32, Asian, 26, and white, 17. It's simple. Every business that does not open up in New York City is going to lead to less tax revenue. Every business that we assure has the ability to survive and reopen will provide more cash revenue to our tax base for our programming and services that are needed. Real estate taxes are passed on from property owner to small business. Many of our small businesses even own their properties and are closing up. I want to remind everyone, real estate taxes, whether it be a business owner, a homeowner, or a tenant, is always paid by those three. So city charges landlord, landlord will pass on those charges to tenants in the form of rent increases in all categories from tenants of apartment buildings, residential homes of one to four families and in commercial businesses. The echoes that were made earlier, 18% on the April, do we have a, a number of the defaults on the real estate taxes for those that were due in April, Deputy Commissioner? 
So I don't have that with me that, that um, a previous council member asked for that same information. So we will be working to provide um, council finance with, with that information. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Scheer. I, I, would have, I would have hoped you would have had that with you. It would have been a telling story of what we can predict for the next quarterly payments. Uh, as you are aware, uh, larger properties pay real estate taxes twice a year in July and in January. It's our residential homes that, are, that pay quarterly. That would have been a telling story for what to expect in declines of real estate tax payments. And I remind everyone that it's just not real estate tax payments that are due in July. It's also water and sewer rates. And they also incur 18% compounded interest uh, penalties for non-payment. Um, this is the time where the city can prove how much it values our small businesses by actually putting their mouth, their money where their mouth is. We often talk about the importance and constantly undermine their very existence. This is an opportunity that if we lose, we'll have long lasting implications. It's not only to the city and our commercial corridors, but to the viability and the future of our city. I don't have any questions, thank you. So, Council member, I, I hear you and your concerns are registered. One thing I do want to point out is for the water and sewer charges, the interest rate is actually the, the same rate that's imposed on properties with assessed values under $250,000. So the interest rate is not 18%. It's um, if council adopts it, it's the three and a quarter percent and the 5% for those properties, all properties um, are charged the same interest rate on water and sewer charges. Th thank you for that clarification, uh, Deputy Commissioner. Um, I forgot that we had made that passage and that made that possible, but that's still 5% uh, when currently the interest rate in banks is zero. Zero. And yet we're charging and penalizing New Yorkers for something that they had no control over, for not being able to pay water and sewer, something that should have been free to begin with something that was free, but today is, is more expensive than fuel in many cases. And I wanna point that out again. Today's water and sewer charges are more expensive than fuel. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Council Member Joni. I also wanna acknowledge we were joined by Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer, and now I'll turn the hearing back over to our committee council. Thank you. Chair Gibson, no other council members uh, have raised their hands, asked questions, and we're ready to move on to the public portion of the hearing when you're ready. Okay. okay. Um, I'd like to remind um, everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling uh, individuals, uh, members of the public one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and you will be called on after the panelist, after the prior panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant Arms will give you the go ahead to begin uh, and begin setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. You will have three minutes for your testimony. Okay, the order of the public testimony is we will start with um, George Sweeting followed by Jonathan Rosenberg and Christy Peel. Thank you. Time starts now. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Gibson and uh, members of the committee. I'm George Sweeting, Deputy Director of the New York City Independent Budget Office. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I will be addressing the two property tax uh, deferral intros. Um, I should note that uh, I believe the language on these intros may have been changing a bit. Uh, so uh, some of my comments may address an out of date version of the legislation, but anyway, uh, let me proceed. COVID-19 has already taken a tremendous toll on New York City and it is far from over. Aside from the devastating health impacts, the need to shutter the economy has left the US and the city in recession with job losses not seen since the Great Depression. 
Many New York homeowners are facing lost or, most, or much diminished incomes and are worried about their ability to pay their property taxes, which are due in a few weeks. Many commercial property owners report that they too may have trouble paying their property taxes because some of their tenants, either of apartments and or commercial space, are unable to pay their rent, leaving landlords with insufficient income to pay all of their bills. The two intros under discussion attempt to address these problems. Without advocating for or against either of these particular proposals, IBO suggests treading carefully, lest the city undermine its most important revenue source, particularly when it remains uncertain whether the federal government will provide additional fiscal relief to the city. The property tax is not only the city's largest tax, but it is also the tax over which we have the most control in terms of how much revenue it can raise. Moreover, it is the city's most stable tax. Over the next 18 months, while the city's other major tax sources are forecast to decline or slow sharply, IBO expects revenue from the property tax to increase, taking at least some of the pressure off the rest of the city's tax base in the tough times ahead. There are three issues that merit particularly close attention. First, and this echoes some of the comments that have already been made, is to ensure that enough taxpayers continue paying on the regular schedule to avoid disrupting the city's cash position. Early summer is the time when the city traditionally relies on July 1 property tax payments to meet its obligations. Given the deferral of income tax payments from April to July this year, there may be some leeway, but there is also greater uncertainty regarding all our taxes. Second is to make sure that we are providing the relief that is necessary, but not offering a break to owners who still have the ability to pay on schedule. At a time when the city is facing huge revenue shortfalls, it cannot afford to be inefficient in targeting relief. Third is to be realistic about the administrative effort that will be necessary to implement a deferral program, particularly on such short notice. Time expired. These proposals offer property tax owners the option of deferring taxes due on July 1. The first would apply to owners whose primary residents have an assessed value below 250,000, which is the vast majority of one, two, three family homes, co-ops and condos, and whose household income is below 200,000. And according to census data, only about 10% of homeowners in the city would be excluded by this criterion. Owners who meet these criteria and who faced some health or economic hardship due to COVID-19 can apply for the right to defer their July 1 tax payment until October 1st without incurring penalty or interest. IBO does not have access to homeowner income data or information on individual and household income, household impacts of COVID-19 that would allow us to offer a robust estimate of how much revenue would be deferred. A rough estimate using property values, census income data, and zip code health statistics suggests that about $500 million in collections could be shifted from July to October, which is about one third of what small property owners usually pay on July 1. It is notable that when looking at zip code level data, areas hardest hit by COVID-19 have low home ownership rates. Home ownership and property values are generally higher in zip codes with relatively low COVID-19 infection rates. The second proposal would also offer owners of commercial properties with assessed value over 250,000 the chance to defer property taxes due July 1, but on different terms. Property owners would have to pay a quarter of their deferred payment by October 1st, 2020, and pay the remainder by May 1st, 2021, with interest accruing, and I may have the wrong information here, we thought it was 9%. Owners with either commercial or residential tenants would be required to offer rent forbearance during their deferral period. Properties affected by the COVID-19 public health orders or occupied by tenants who were impacted would be eligible. Many properties would be eligible under this proposal, and these properties are responsible for a much greater share of baseline property taxes than small property owners. However, the accrual of interest and the requirements to offer rental forbearance during the deferral period will likely discourage many from participating. IBO does not have an estimate of the amount of revenue that would be deferred under this proposal. Both of these proposals would take effect on July 1. They both require individual deferral agreements between property owners and the Department of Finance to be worked out quickly enough so that owners can benefit when the need is greatest. 
The finance department would also be required to promulgate rules and applications for owners to submit their documentation of COVID-19 indoor economic impacts that would qualify the owner for a deferral. A major concern is that the administrative burden of both applicants and the finance department will be high and pressure will grow to approve applications with little review. This could result in granting deferrals that might not be justified, undermining the collection of property tax revenue the city is counting on. So thank you for the opportunity to testify today and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, I see that Councilmember Yeager has a question for Mr. Sweeting. Thank you very much. Okay, am I unmuted? Okay, there we go. Thank you very much. I, it's actually not a question, Mr. Sweeting, but uh, when I read your testimony uh, about an hour ago and, uh, and I heard you speaking now, it jogged my memory of something I neglected to mention earlier. Um, uh, and I appreciate that you pointed it out. Uh, our property tax revenues in the city are uh, projected to go up. Uh, and it's an important point that should be mentioned here. We should be mentioning that throughout. Uh, we, we claim, uh, we, I mean the greater class of politicians, claim that we don't raise taxes on New Yorkers. But every single year, people get higher tax bills on their property because of the automated ways that the taxes go up. Um, this year, people are going to be paying higher taxes. July payment is going to be a high, it's not a question for you, Mr. Sweeting. I just wanna make sure it's stated on the record today. This, July's payment is going to be higher for New Yorkers than their April payment was. Um, and that's a fact, and that's gonna be that way if, whether they're semi-annual or, or uh, quarterly. Um, we need to do something, we must absolutely do something to relieve this burden, to tell New Yorkers that they have to pay more money in July when they're, almost everybody is hurting uh, is really irresponsible. And I, and I appreciate that you brought that point out. This is not a question for you. I yield back the time to the Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, can we please hear from Jonathan Rosenberg followed by Christy Peel and Vijay Dhanapani. Time starts now. Good morning, Chairman Gibson and members of the Committee on Finance. I am Jonathan Rosenberg, the Director of Budget Review at the New York City Independent Budget Office. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to testify today regarding intro 1952, which would require the creation of an expenditure tracker for all city expenses related to the COVID-19 pandemic. IBO's role is to provide nonpartisan information on the city's budget to members of the council, other elected officials, and the public. As we have testified in the past, we generally support efforts to increase government transparency, particularly when it provides the public with information that is presented in a straightforward, easy to understand way. This is of particular importance today in light of the many millions of dollars the city is spending on COVID-19 related expenses. City expenditures related to the COVID-19 pandemic have already exceeded $2 billion with $2.8 billion budgeted for such expenditures in the current fiscal year. But these totals only include what the city plans to submit to federal emergency management agency for reimbursement and not expenditures using the funds flowing to the city from the four coronavirus relief packages passed by Congress earlier this year. In April, IBO estimated that over $5 billion in aid from these relief packages could eventually flow to the city. Note that this total does not include other funds that are expected to be provided to the agencies outside the city's budget, including the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, New York City Health and Hospitals, and the city's public housing authority. In early April, IBO brought online its own dashboard to track the city's COVID-19 related expenditures. IBO's dashboard presents COVID-19 expenditure information aggregated in three ways, by date, by agency, and by expenditure type. The aggregated data is also broken down into its component parts with spending by date categorized by agency and spending by agency broken down by expense description. The dashboard envisioned under intro 1952 would add considerably more detail on individual contracts and also provide a searchable database of all contracts and purchases tracked in the dashboard. Because of the special circumstances surrounding the pandemic and the need to quickly procure many critical items, the city waived its normal contracting process. While few would doubt that there was a need to expeditiously acquire necessary life-saving materials, it is also of critical importance that the expenditures are done in the light of day. A public database and tracker would provide the transparency necessary particularly when the safeguards provided for by the city's typical contracting process are suspended. Given IBO's support for increased transparency and data sharing in general, 
The COVID-19 expense tracker required by intro 1952 is of particular interest to IBO and certainly would be a benefit to the public. Thank you for giving me this time to speak with you and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Seeing no questions, uh, can we next hear from Christy Peel followed by Vijay Dhanapani and Michael Forrest. Thank you. Time starts now. Thank you, uh, Commissioner, uh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Council uh, Member Gibson and the Finance Committee, as well as the Public Advocate for introducing the installment payment plan bill. Uh, the Center for New York City Neighborhood uh, pr uh, promotes and protects affordable home ownership in New York that middle and working class families are able to build strong, thriving communities. Uh, I just wanna highlight the impact of uh, prop property tax payments on lower income homeowners today. As you may know, uh, we've served over 100,000 homeowners since 2008, and 60% of those homeowners are people of color and an average household income of $38,000. Uh, very briefly, I also wanna thank the council and the public advocate for your tireless leadership right now in some very difficult times. I know these are challenging circumstances and we really appreciate your, your leadership right now. Uh, it's important to acknowledge, obviously, the devastating impacts uh, the coronavirus epidemic has had on uh, our neighbors, our, our neighborhoods, our communities, and our budget. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure that we don't uh, put the burden of the, of the recovery um, from this economic fallout uh, on our, our poorest neighbors. Uh, so we need to make sure you know, we learn from the lessons of the Great Recession, uh, and we know that the economic impacts are likely to exacerbate existing inequalities across racial and economic line, lines. So we strongly support the bill introduced by the public advocate and council members Lander and Kalos. Uh, I just wanted to highlight a couple of uh, the reasons why we think it's so important. As many of you know, uh, property tax burdens were a problem before uh, the coronavirus epidemic. Uh, for, uh, there was a report that came out last year from the comptroller that highlighted for homeowners making under 50,000 per year their property tax burden uh, is 12%, uh, which is much higher uh, than your typical homeowner, uh, as highlighted by some of the economists. Um, temporary stop gaps like the payment plan are really important, but uh, LMI homeowners are, are at severe risk right now with the coronavirus epidemic, uh, not only individually impacted, but the longer term economic outlook. Uh, there was a late May Census Bureau survey of New York State homeowners that found they found that 13% of New York State homeowners have only uh, a slight confidence in their ability to pay this coming month's uh, mortgage obligations. Uh, of New York respondents that reported a loss of household em employment income, only 54% have a high confidence in their ability to make next month's mortgage payments. So when you think about the impacts of those mortgage payments on our property taxes, it's obviously severe. But again, I want to make sure we're not uh, building the recovery on the backs of our lowest income neighbors. We know the racial uh, impacts of, uh, of COVID-19 are disproportionately uh, hurting our Black and Latinx neighbors. Uh, again, I'm expired. Uh, if I could just finish, I just wanted to make sure we don't forget uh, the role of the tax lien sale as well. Uh, we want to make sure that the tax lien sale doesn't exacerbate uh, economic pain and racial disparities. We know that uh, the tax lien sale is much more likely uh, to uh, sell liens and census tracts that are predominantly Black and Latinx. Um, and, and we want uh, uh, really uh, to make sure that we're thinking about a broader strategy to stabilize homeowners and communities to make sure that we don't exacerbate the racial wealth gap uh, and, and, and exacerbate some economic pain that was there again before uh, the coronavirus epidemic. Um, in 2018, there were 30,000 New York City families who received pre-foreclosure notices uh, a lot of that six of the t highest 10 zip codes where those uh, were received were in uh, Canarsie, Flatlands, uh, Marine Park in Brooklyn, Rochdale, Springfield Gardens, and St. Albans, Queens, Bullshead, New Springville, and Staten Island. Uh, and in 2019, we saw foreclosure auctions increasing. So there's a lot of economic pain out there already uh, that we really need to address, and we need to make sure that uh, any steps that we take in preserving our city's income. Uh, you know, are not disproportionately born on, on our, our neighbors and our communities that have been disproportionately hit uh, physically, 
in their health and in their homes and in their pocketbooks. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, next, may we hear from Vijay Danapani, followed by Michael Forrest and Robert Altman. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Gibson and members of the Finance Committee. I'm Vijay Dandapani, President and CEO of the Hotel Association of New York City, also known as HANEC, a trade association representing over 300 hotels in the city. As you are aware, the impact of COVID-19 on our industry has been extreme. Revenue has dropped over 75% as compared to last year with no meaningful recovery expected till 2024. Hotels across the city are closing, either permanently or temporarily and unsure if they will be able to reopen and rehire workers. Over 85% of the 55,000 employees in the city in the hotel industry have been laid off. And unlike others in our tax class, we not only own our property, but also pay the real property taxes, as well as occupancy and sales taxes. As a result, we have both a solvency and a liquidity crisis. Through all of this, we're doing everything we can to support the city's COVID-19 relief efforts and have partnered with the city in providing hotel space at cost and sometimes below whenever we can help address a need. Notably, Hanek is administering a complex FEMA compliant contract essentially for free with a very modest fee to pay for two personnel we hired. We hope that our efforts will help slow the spread of COVID and help keep New Yorkers safe. The proposed legislation for properties with an assessed value about 250,000 would give us much needed additional time to pay our already disproportionately large property tax burden. This bill would provide us with some desperately needed relief at a time when most hotels have had almost no cash flow for, excuse me, no cash flow for a period of months and are not seeing any change in the near future. Efforts such as this will make it more likely that hotels survive the economic impact of the pandemic and reopen on the other side of it and therefore provide an important tax base to the city. I might add that it's a billion dollars last year through multiple taxes assessed on hotels and can need to boost the city's tourism economy. On behalf of my members, I'd like to thank you all for this effort and giving me the opportunity to present testimony. I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Seeing no questions, let's move on to Michael Forrest, followed by Robert Altman and Mark Miller. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Michael Forrest and I'm a small business owner. Um, my business is being a landlord and I'm here to talk about the property tax deferral program um, that you're proposing. I wanted to thank council member Chin and everybody else involved in this legislation. An example, oh, sorry. I'm also chairman of the board of directors of the Lower East Side Business Improvement District, also known as the Lower East Side Partnership. An example of a small business and small landlord in the Lower East Side is a building with a total gross revenue of about $350,000, 70% of which comes from a restaurant that has been closed since March and has not paid rent since February. And the other 30% of the revenue comes from the upstairs apartments. These are small business owners that need help. To date, there has been no relief for small landlords at all. In fact, the PPP program specifically excluded landlords. I am in support of this legislation, but my one issue is with the interest rate. Ideally, the interest rate would be zero to maybe 2% max. If tenants are not paying landlords, landlords don't have the funds to pay taxes and other essential services like heat, hot water, and repairs. One way to maybe preserve the crucial income that the city needs from real estate taxes is to carve out landlords that have already put aside money for real estate taxes through their lenders. A lot of lenders, mortgage lenders, escrow for taxes all year round. And if those landlords have the money, they should pay. But for other landlords that maybe don't have a mortgage or have lenders that don't escrow for taxes and they don't have the money, this relief would be really, really great. Um, myself and a lot of other small landlords are struggling financially. We are essential businesses that have remained open during the pandemic, but none of our expenses have changed. Without small landlords, mom and, uh, mom and pop stores will also suffer. There are large head funds and predatory private equity firms waiting in the wings to snap up these properties. In fact, on May 26th, the New York Times ran an article that started with the following quote, hoping to take advantage 
of wreckage in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic, investors are preparing to snap up commercial real estate at rock bottom prices. This bill will help keep the fabric of our community. This bill will help keep mom and pop small businesses alive by allowing landlords to provide relief to those small businesses. One example of something I'm trying to do is I have a hair salon who had 10 chairs in their store pre-COVID. Post-COVID, due to the social distancing requirements, they will only have four chairs. The problem for her is that these six other chairs or stylists who are independent contractors, if they can't come to work in that store, they're gonna have to go somewhere else. And she is basically going to lose her business. She's not gonna be able to keep her employees if they have nowhere to work. So one thing that we're talking about doing is providing her with a vacant store that we have for free. Time expired. To allow her to use that store during the coronavirus pandemic. At that time, we would receive no income from that store, but it would at least allow her to preserve her business. That's the example of what some small landlords are trying to do. And with this tax relief bill, they would be able to do that. I want to thank you for allowing me to testify. And uh, that's all my statement. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no questions, let's move on to Mr. Robert Altman, followed by Mark Miller and Tim Laughlin. Time starts now. Hi, this is Robert Altman. I'm testifying on behalf of the Queens and Bronx Building Association. We actually oppose this legislation for multiple reasons. First, we feel it doesn't do enough. A 9% interest rate is frankly too high. If you're going to keep us, if you're going to keep any landlord whole and not have the pandemic infect them, they should in fact be paying what the city's borrowing rate itself is. This way the city does not lose money, but in fact, the city does not gain. In this situation, the city is taking advantage with a 9% interest rate, is actually taking advantage of the uh, pandemic to create a profit. Second, the scope of this is actually very narrow. Even though people have talked about um, mortgages and such, most payments are made by, in fact, the bank uh, that holds the mortgage. In fact, the bank is the one who would have to probably enter into the agreement because it, it has the responsibility to do so. Even if there is no escrow provision in the mortgage so that the bank is not paying but the property owner is, in fact, there is a provision in the mortgage which will say that tax payments must be made at the time that they are due. So unless you're going to change the interest rate, uh, the uh, payment date on taxes from July 1 to some other date, these businesses will be, will be in default of their mortgage. And finally, if anybody is a, as a legitimate small business owner and has some, they will have a line of credit. In a lot of respects, it will make a hell of a lot more sense to use the line of credit rather than to use a 9%, in effect, a 9% loan from the city because it does a number of different things. First of all, it's a lower interest rate. And two, the payments can be spread out over a longer time period. So I don't think the functionality of these bills actually do very much for a vast majority of the businesses that are in fact impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Given that these bills are so small, so stingy, we actually oppose both of them. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, can we hear next from Mark Miller, Tim Laughlin, and Megan Joy? Time starts now. Mr. Miller, are you available to speak? We will return to Mr. Miller, uh, moving on to Tim Laughlin, followed Hear me by now? Megan Joy. Hello? Oh, OK, uh, Mark Miller, go ahead. OK, sorry about that. I had a technical issue. Hi, I'm Mark Miller. I'm a small property owner located in Lower Manhattan on Orchard Street. My family has managed a walk-up property in the Lower East Side for 117 years. 
if you want to help lower income groups such as students and people starting their in their careers then you need to provide relief to the many small New York City landlords with property tax deferment. I personally know each tenant, a few of which are multi-generational, and I look at them as people, not as a number on a spreadsheet. When a tenant loses their job, I work with them. I give them time, or in the case of COVID-19, I've allowed some tenants to pay half their rent until their jobs come back fully. Many of our residential tenants are not renewing their leases. And, returning to their, and they're returning to their hometowns because schools are moving online, company employees are not required to work in their office, and New York City amenities like restaurants and bars are closed. Many of the small buildings in the Lower East Side, Chinatown, and other areas in the city have rent-regulated tenants. And we rely disproportionately on income from our commercial tenants to cover expenses. Currently, our commercial tenants are not paying us. For example, I have a commercial retail tenant owned by a private equity company that didn't qualify for the PPP program. I offer them a permanent 60% off on their rent while they're closed and will consider further reductions when they're allowed to open if sales numbers are not coming in. Unfortunately, no one has gotten back to me about my offer. Under the current dire circumstances, the city should allow small landlords to defer their property taxes with either no interest on the deferment or with a special COVID rate set at what banks charge on mortgage interest, which is closer to 3%. Typically, 25% of our gross rent goes to property taxes, and that is before mortgage, insurance, water, sewer, and sanitation violations. Our old buildings require more expensive repairs, and the new legislative changes that took place on June 15th of last year makes it cost prohibitive to do necessary repairs. If you don't help the small business landlords of New York City now, we will go under and you will find yourselves in a 1970s sequel, but worse. Thanks for your time. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, may we hear from Kim Laughlin, followed by Megan Joy and Eric Dillenberger. Time starts now. Good morning, Chair Gibson, Council Member Chin, uh, members of the Finance Committee. My name is Tim Laughlin. I am the president of the Lower East Side Partnership, uh, the business improvement district for the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Thank you for the opportunity to allow me to testify today regarding pre-considered 6277. First, I'd like to thank uh, the council for their continued support of the small business community uh, and providing resources and assistance by way of policy throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd also like to particularly thank uh, our local council member, Margaret Chen, uh, who's been a leader in sponsoring this legislation before the committee uh, and for her ongoing general support of her district, especially the Lower East Side. Uh, the partnership boundaries include approximately 435 properties, many of which are four to six story former tenement buildings with ground floor retail and upper level residential units that have characterized the Lower East Side for decades. Governor Cuomo's executive order in mid-March as you know, has shuttered retail restaurants, bars, and other businesses within the community, um, forcing property owners in our district to struggle to maintain operations and pay their bills without rent. Uh, the majority of our property owners are small businesses themselves. Some of them have spoken here today, many owning one or just a handful of buildings as their primary source of income. Uh, and they are important parts of the fabric of our community that ensure that New York City remains the place that it was. The proposed legislation would allow owners of property with an assessed value of over $250,000 to defer payments uh, and provide an important immediate and necessary relief. We support the bill and we urge the council uh, to move forward in its passage. Uh, we do express concerns with respect to the proposed interest rate. While 7.5% is still better than 18, uh, we concur that a, a rate commensurate with the current lending market at 3% uh, would be more appropriate. We also just would uh, point out that language regarding rent forbearance uh, should be clarified. Many property owners have already provided unique relief in those prior ag agreements that they have made, uh, especially during the pandemic before any relief to them was provided uh, should be equally considered. Uh, the partnership strongly supports the intent of this bill. We believe this relief is necessary to prevent buildings owned by mom and pop landlords with long ties in our community from falling into the hands of giant private equity firms who lack any connection with our neighborhoods. This is what happened in 2008 
to single family homes and we cannot allow it to happen in 2020 to multifamily small owners who house significant concentrations of the most vulnerable New Yorkers uh, in rent controlled and stabilized apartments. I thank you for the opportunity to testify and thank you again for your leadership on this important issue. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, before we hear from Megan Joy and Eric Dillenberger, uh, I want to alert um, Anna Rosa and Jan Lee. If you join us, you have registered for testimony, but are not currently on the uh, in the Zoom. Perhaps you're watching the live feed. Uh, so now may we hear from Megan Joy, followed by Eric Dillenberger. Time start now. Sorry, can you hear me now? <laughs> we can. Great. Uh, my name is Megan Joy, and I'm a small business owner on the low side. Um, and I just want to thank you for your time. I am in support of this bill. Um, we've been out of business, completely closed down at all locations um, for over three months now. Um, and as much as the PPP loans have um, come and handy, well, especially now that the rules have changed on them. Um, it's really coming down um, to individual negotiations with our landlords. And depending on how leveraged they are or um, uh, what their financial situation is, is how much leeway they can give us with rent. Um, and uh, we really need their help in this situation because we don't know, one, we can't pay the rent, for the last three months. Um, we've only had two weeks revenue for that whole time, but we also don't know what's happening in the future. Um, we don't know if there's gonna be a resurgence and we don't know, we, we need to not just deal with the three months rent that we owe, but also what does the next um, 18 months look like um, under these new conditions? Um, so a lot of it's coming down to, you know, not just dealing with the rent, but also dealing with lease negotiations um, for the future year and a half. Um, so any relief that the small property owners can get will be a relief to small businesses. Um, yes, I'd like to see more clarity on the floor forbearance because a lot of, we've, uh, we've gotten breaks on rent as it is for the last few months. Um, and, um, and I'd like to see them pay a smaller interest rate. I mean, these are, these are, smaller, these are smaller landlords that have ties in our community that care about our community. And I don't wanna see them getting swallowed up by the Blackstones and the Kushners of, of the world. Um, th that's it, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Eric Dillenberger, please. Time starts now. Hello, um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm the chair of the uh, Walker Street Block Association in the Tribeca East uh, District, right, right on the border of uh, Chinatown. And I'm in Margaret Chin's district. And I, I do want to thank her for the leadership that she's showing on this, uh, on this issue. And I want to thank uh, uh, um, also uh, uh, Jaeger and uh, Ganache for their, their comments on the subject as well. Um, generations of families uh, work and savings are threatened by to be wiped out by the COVID-19 uh, crisis and the expense burden of taking care of our properties and the housing of families. Uh, the single largest component of most of our expenses is often real estate taxes and the water and sewer taxes, which are levied by the government. And um, the formula that this tax is computed by is often arbitrary and unfair. Our taxes are currently compiled on income projections of our income from two years ago. Um, that world on which these taxes were compiled no longer exists. Everything has been dramatically altered by COVID for everyone. Um, I wanna applaud you guys and, this, uh, and the mayor's office for recognizing that government needs to do something, but I think more needs to be done. Um, specifically on the late payment uh, interest for taxes, it's an 18% per annum uh, charge. And as uh, Councilperson Yeager mentioned, this in many states would be considered usurious uh, and you, you'd be facing criminal charges. Um, we recommend that the late penalty rate be waived, that there's a moratorium passed on tax lien sales and that the tax date, the due tax date uh, be pushed back. 
Um, as we're, you guys have pointed out, the government's going to need every single penny that they can get coming up. And there are some owners who can pay uh, and can pay early. To incentivize those owners to pay early, uh, we recommend a tax dis discount rate of 1.5% per month for prepayment. This could be a win-win situation. And as Councilwoman Chin pointed out, there was a precedence for this in the 1970s when the city's revenue crisis was uh, equivalent to what you're seeing now. Um, and so I, I think that um, this could work for everyone. Um, that's all my comments. And I thank you again very much for your, your hearing me today. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Chair Gibson, we have now heard from all members of the public who registered to testify today. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who signed up to testify for today's hearing. Thank you to all of my colleagues who have joined us on the call, the members of the public. Uh, I wanna thank public advocate Jamani Williams for his leadership in uh, carrying this particular legislation. Also wanna recognize council member Margaret Chin for her leadership in carrying uh, this legislation as well related to uh, property tax and a payment deferment system. I think it's extremely, extremely obvious uh, that we have to do more as an administration. If you listen to the testimony of many small property owners who've talked about, you know, the latitude, the flexibility of trying to do as much as they can to provide relief for their own tenants, but as owners, they need relief as well. Uh, we've talked about smaller interest rates, uh, really for the smaller property owners that sometimes get swallowed by some of the larger property owners. And we as a city really have to do better. So I want everyone to know all of our small business owners and property owners that the city council is working extremely hard on your behalf. And we need you to continue to share with us ideas and provide your input on what we can do as a government to help provide more relief for all of you. Um, how we can reduce some of the burdens and the challenges that many of you have been confronted with as we rebuild and heal as a city. I think we all acknowledge that we will never be the same. Uh, COVID-19, this pandemic, we've lost 21,000 New York residents, families, and those that have been impacted and lost the battle to COVID. Thousands that survived um, and we pray for them, but we know as a city, we will not be the same. Um, and so it's going to take all of us, elected officials, government, owners, and all stakeholders and unions, and all of the representatives of our businesses to really come together and be creative and innovative in our approach to look at all options. Everything should be on the table. We should leave no stone unturned because the time is really now to provide so much relief. Uh, we know that challenging times lie ahead, but as the speaker likes to say, you know, we will get through this together um, and this too shall pass and we will get through this as a community, as a city. And I thank all of you for your testimony. And certainly we will follow up with the agencies on a number of questions that were not answered today. We will reach out to OMB, uh, MOX, as well as Department of Finance. I also want to thank the Sergeant at Arms for running a great hearing today. Thank you to the Finance Division, to all of our analysts and our committee councils for all of your work. I also want to recognize Councilmember Mark Traeger. Thank you for joining with us on the COVID spending tracker bill, which we will continue to push for. Um, and with that, this hearing of the Committee on Finance. Uh, Chair Gibson. Here. Yes. Would you like to recognize uh, Council Member Chin, whose hand just went up? Oh, yes, of course. Yes. Council Member Margaret Chin. Yes, for closing remarks. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Gibson, for chairing uh, this hearing today. And I really want to thank uh, my constituents, you know, especially from the Low East Side Partnership, the owner, the small businesses, um, Eric and, and all the owners for coming today to tell your story and tell your struggle because we've been working very hard trying to get the city to understand the situation of the small property owner and how they really need relief. And they've been devastated by this pandemic. And if we don't do something now, we're gonna lose these uh, legacy buildings. And like, we can't let that happen. They provide affordable housing for our city. 
and we need to recognize that? I mean, yeah, I mean, like, why are they paying such high interest rate and you lump them together with the big guy? It never made sense. So I think this is an opportunity for us to really start to change. This is only the beginning and we want to make this change happen now, uh, but it's got to go forward. There's got to be some lasting change of how properties are being assessed and how, you know, property taxes are, are, are being collected. I mean, we got to really separate out um, buildings and legacy buildings and a uh, long time small property owner who are doing the good stuff, providing affordable housing versus the big guy. So I really want to thank everyone uh, for coming today and uh, let's all work together to make sure we bring some relief to pro small property owner. Thank you. Thank you all the sergeant. Thank you to the finance committee staff. Thank you so much, council member Chen. And thank you for your leadership. In your opening, you talked about, you know, the devastating impact that COVID has had on Chinatown and all of your district. And I appreciate you bringing this legislation forward because I think, again, we have to recognize the impact that this pandemic has had on all of the smaller owners that sometimes feel like they don't have a voice. So I'm grateful that they have you as their champion in the council and we're going to do this and, and make progress together. So I thank you council member Chen and thank you to all of my colleagues. And once again, thank you to the staff. Um, I hope that our finance chair council member Drum is proud. We ran a great hearing today. I wanna thank uh, council member Drum in his absence. Sorry that he could not join us today, uh, but we will certainly keep in touch uh, as the budget process is underway and we work on an adopted budget by June 30th. Thank you again. This committee of the, this hearing of the Committee on Finance is hereby adjourned. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Be safe and have a blessed day. Thank you guys.